Today's lecture will be over chapter 21, section 3, objectives number 1, examine the procurement and distribution of water resources in Southwest Asia. Number 2, describe the formation, production, and movement of oil in this region. So obviously today what we're going to be talking about is we're going to be talking about water and we're going to be talking about oil. Um, when we start looking at Southwest Asia, obviously these two things are going to be extremely important. Dams and irrigation systems, large farms and growing populations require dams and irrigation. Turkey is building dams and man-made lakes on the upper Euphrates. A uh, controversial project will deprive downstream countries of water. See this a lot with dams is that if you stop the flow of water, um, what eventually happens is, is that people that are downstream of it aren't going to be able to participate and have uh, the water. So. Um, um, this is where the controversy kind of lies. Israel's National Water Carrier Project takes water from northern areas, carries it to central and south in the Gave Desert. Uh, water flows through several countries, so project is creating some conflict there because, of course, those countries would like the water as well. Now, modern water technology, drip techno or excuse me, drip irrigation. This is where you have small pipes that slowly drip water just above the ground. Remember, when you're talking about irrigation, one of the big problems is evaporation. So if you go ahead and you uh, do like you do in the United States is that they're going to go ahead and they're going to spray the water all over the crops and then what happens is is that you lose a lot to evaporation. Well like in Nebraska we've got quite a bit of water so it's not that big of a deal. In this area where water is such a commodity this drip irrigation makes it so that you don't lose that much to evaporation. Now you also have desalinization is where you remove salt from ocean water at these treatment plants. The plants are very expensive so the countries that don't have much water can't use this desalinization um, and then you're not going to be able to have enough water for irrigation and things like that and of course uh, hopefully everybody realizes that you can't use salt water to um, irrigate because it will just kill your crops Wastewater can be treated also. What we're talking about here is water that's used um, uh, essentially for humans to um, go to the bathroom in. Um, what happens is, is that this wastewater, uh, they try to basically take the bad stuff out of there, but again, costs a lot of money. You also have fossil water is pumped from underground aquifers. This is water that's been in an aquifer for a long period of time. Uh, rainfall won't refill aquifers, so what you're doing is, is that you're basically taking away future water and and using it right now. Another issue in this area is going to be oil and of course form of petroleum. Oil, natural gas deposits 4 million of years ago, sea covered the area, the remains of plants and animal, animals mingled into sand and mud. Pressure and heat slowly transform the material into uh, hydrocarbons and then this is of course what's going to create the oil. Oil and gas are not in underground pools but in tiny pores of, of rocks. Uh, Non-porous rock barriers trap the gas and oil below the surface, makes oil Oil difficult to find and also it, it makes it difficult to remove. Wasn't found in this region until about the 1920s, 1930s and this is when this area starts to get a big, big boom during this time. Industrialization, automobiles also increase the need for petroleum. First oil discovered in 1908 in Persia. More oil fields are found in the Arabian Peninsula than Persian Gulf in 1939. So what we see then is, is that this area which a lot of people thought was completely wasteless because wasteful because of the um, large deserts. Now all of a sudden it becomes very rich, very powerful. 1948, Al-Ghafar field discovered at the eastern edge of the Rubakali Desert becomes one of the world's largest oil field. It contains one quarter of Saudi Arabia's oil reserves. Saudi Arabia, again we've talked about them before, very very Islamic um, areas but at the same time very very big with uh, oil. Now, crude oil is petroleum that has not been processed. What you have is you have a refinery with con which converts this crude oil into use for products. So just taking out the crude oil would be like just taking the cotton um, that you make and then you have to go ahead and you have to make it into a shirt. A refinery is where they take this crude oil and they make it into petroleum. Uh, pipelines move crude oil to refineries and ports. Uh, this happens on the ports of the Persian Gulf, the Red Sea, the Mediterranean. Tankers can carry petroleum to world markets. Um, in some places, old refineries process crude oil near these ports. Now, one of the big issues and the big risk of transporting oil is going to be oil spills. Largest oil spill occurred in January 1991 during the Persian Gulf War. Uh, Kuwait tankers and oil storage tanks were blown up. 
240 million gallons of crude oil is going to spill into the water. Um, so what we see is is that there's a couple different things that we have to make sure that we know um, about this type of or these oil spills. Uh, you can have buried pipelines that reduce the uh, accidents, but they're monitored for leaks. When the leaks happen, now you have to go and you have to basically dig them up and fix them, and that can be very expensive and costly. Tankers are high pollution risk. There's a couple things that they can do. Number one, they can go ahead and they can run aground. They can also collide with each other, and then of course the underground tank so the double holes does prevent some of the spills basically making it so that if one breaks it it falls into another one but what we see is is that there's always a risk of transporting crude oil this completes this completes chapter 21 section 3 please complete the assessment at this time